the correlation between perceived mate attractiveness uh, with regards to women perceiving men, the correlation between socioeconomic status and perceived attractiveness is about 0.6, which is a higher correlation than the correlation between general cognitive ability and grades. And I use that as an example because that's one of the most robust and powerful findings in the social sciences. Whereas the correlation between socioeconomic status and perceived mate attractiveness for women by men is zero or slightly negative. So it's a walloping difference. And that's associated with the proclivity of women to preferentially mate across hierarchies and up and men to mate across hierarchies and down. And that's relatively well established cross culturally, and the proclivity doesn't ameliorate much in, say, the Scandinavian countries. It ameliorates slightly. And then there are other hallmarks of attractiveness on the female side, and this is where I want to go with the beauty myth. We know that um, babies, for example, will gaze much longer, even as newborns, at symmetrical faces. And there is this doll-like aspect that you described. So one of the hallmarks of sexual attractiveness is neotenic faces. And so there's a proclivity for organisms to evolve towards their juvenile forms. That's neoteny. And it's such a pervasive tendency that it even characterizes animated characters, as uh, Stephen Jay Gould was at pains to establish. It's quite comical. But one of the hallmarks of cuteness is a babyishness of face. And you can see that in the like plush toys and the sorts of things that are often bought as dolls for kids or, or for sentimental adults have very large eyes, very small noses, very symmetrical faces. There's all sorts of hallmarks of beauty from a biological perspective. Many of them seem to be associated with fecundity, um, particularly on the female side. And that is very harsh. It's a very, very harsh standard. And when I read The Beauty Myth, which was a long time ago, by the way, because it was published in, what, 91? 93, 93, yeah. 93, 93. Um, I was curious about what you made of the biological markers of beauty and what you th how you think that plays into, what did you describe, the Iron Maiden straitjacket that's placed on women in terms of the, what the ideal of their sexual self-presentation. Right. So thank you for asking. You may be right. It may actually have been 91, um, came out first in Britain and then in the United States. So respectfully, I'm familiar with these arguments and uh, respectfully, I'm very familiar with David Buss's work. And I, I think that it's fundamentally flawed and I'll, I'll get to why. Um, so first, let me concede. Um, you know, of course, uh, it's, it's thoroughly documented that <clears throat> there are markers of um, health and attractiveness, uh, health and fertility that are often cross-cultural. Um, and certainly symmetrical features, um, you know, rosy skin showing good circulation, you know, youth, uh, all, all of those are kind of tran transcendental um, markers yeah. for attractiveness. However, one giant intellectual flaw, respectfully, in um, pretty much all of the studies that I've seen of the evolutionary biologists is that they focus on these markers in women and they don't um, test for what women find attractive in men. They, they project or they construct kind of experiments or surveys that prove tendentiously, in my view, that women find wealth uh, or professional accomplishment attractive, and that that kind of uh, substitutes for physical beauty. But they don't ask women who are heterosexual, um, what are the markers for you of beauty in men or attractiveness in men? And if they did, and they don't, they would find broad shoulders, they would find, you know, symmetry, they would find maybe, you know, <laughs> sorry, penis size, um, you know, they would find maybe uh, 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 a muscle tone that shows that they can kind of effectively, you know, impregnate a woman. They they would probably find height as a marker, right? And well, they, it's notable well, they, to me. They, like they they have they have investigated that. I mean, there is a fair bit of overlap in the biomarkers, let's say, for what men and women find mutually physically attractive. Although the way that's manifested varies to some degree, as you pointed out. Shoulder to waist ratio, for example, is a marker, as you can see in superhero portrayals of men, for example. 
And the, 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 the cardinal difference seems to be too, though, it, you know, it's also not the sophisticated evolutionary psychologists don't assume that women are after wealth. What they assume is that women will use markers of wealth as indicators of productive competence. Right, but to, now, let me so, get there, please, because to me that's <clears throat> also a conceptual flaw. Um, I'll, I'll get to why in just a minute. But I know, I have to note for the record, as a feminist analyst, that I have literally never seen a study that asks women if they find penis size a marker for sexual attractiveness. And I think scientists don't want to run that study. Be, male scientists don't want to run that study because it would be unpopular <laughs> conclusions. Um, so I, I guess to me, the whole field of evolutionary biological studies that conclude that um, sexual attractiveness is a is is kind of um, gendered female, and uh, and that for males there are other proxies for sexual attractiveness is really convenient for men. Um, because they don't have to come up against the raw brute fact that there are, you know, physical things women evaluate men for if they're heterosexual, just like there are physical things men so, evaluate so, okay, so for. Okay, so let me ask you about that a little bit too, because you say that it's convenient for men, and so I mean, I'm I'm never certain what form of differential perception on the part of each sex is convenient for which sex. I mean, the entire sexual battlefield, let's say, is fraught with catastrophe and opportunity for both sexes. I mean, one of the things you do see, for example, is that women are much harsher in the evaluations of attractiveness of men than men are of women. So women, men rate women, 50% of women, as below, attractive, uh, below average in attractiveness. And women rate 80% of men as below average in physical attractiveness. And well, and and like I am I, I want to be absolutely 100 percent crystal clear here that I am not blaming women for this. I understand why this is, I believe. Now, it's in the interest of a woman, biologically and practically, to find a partner who is as competent as competent as she is, or more competent, because fundamentally what she's trying to do is redress the differential burden that reproduction places on women. And so totally the disagree. reason that women... Totally disagree with you. I think that's out of date respectfully, but I'll wait for you to finish. Okay, well, okay. Well, so I'm curious about why you would, why you would consider that, because consider that out of date, because first of all, one of the definitions of what constitutes female biologically is the female sex, biologically speaking, is almost invariably the sex that devotes more biological time and energy to reproduction than the alternative sex. So you see that even at the level of sperm and egg, because the egg has a volume that is multiple thousands of times larger than the sperm. And even at that level, there's more resources being devoted to the difficult job of reproduction at the female level. And of course, women have a nine-month gestation period, which is very onerous, and then they do they are charged with primary responsibility for infant caregiving, especially during the first year. And we know perfectly well that the differential burden of reproduction on women is such that single women who have a child are much more likely to descend into poverty. And the reason for that, at least in part, is, well, it's actually very difficult to have a child. And it's a 40-hour-a-week job at minimum, and to add the necessity of uh, working and providing on top of that means an 80-hour work week. And so it isn't obvious to me why the hypothesis that women would be motivated to redress that fundamental biological differential, I don't understand why that would be an objectionable hypothesis, even from the feminist perspective. Well, let doesn't me, it just recognize that women are more at risk on the sexual and reproductive front? I mean, I recognize what you're saying there. Um, I guess what I would say is there are as many, I like, get, first let me say, I think the whole field of evolutionary biology being presented to explain contemporary 21st century gender roles or expectations or norms is respectfully, uh, I think it has almost no intellectual merit 
I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, because you can, I mean, I've read the whole range of evolutionary biologists, biologists who are usually invoked, right? And they're always tendentious and they're always talking about circumstances that no longer exist. 